Howard's End by E. M. Forster Chapter 26 Next morning a fine mist covered the peninsula. The weather promised well, and the outline of the castle mound grew clearer each moment that Margaret watched it. Presently she saw the keep, and the sun painted the rubble gold and charged the white sky with blue. The shadow of the house gathered itself together and fell over the garden. A cat looked up at her window and mewed. Lastly, the river appeared, still holding the mists between its banks and its overhanging alders, and only visible as far as a hill, which cut off its upper reaches. Margaret was fascinated by Oniton. She had said that she loved it, but it was rather its romantic tension that held her. The rounded druids of whom she had caught glimpses in her drive, the rivers hurrying down from them to England, the carelessly modelled masses of the lowered hills, thrilled her with poetry. The house was insignificant, but the prospect from it would be an eternal joy, and she thought of all the friends she would have to stop in it, and of the conversion of Henry himself to a rural life. Society, too, promised favourably. The rector of the parish had dined with them last night, and she found that he was a friend of her father's, and so knew what to find in her. She liked him. He would introduce her to the town. While on her other side, Sir James Bitter sat, repeating that she had only to give the word, and he would whip up the county families for twenty miles round. Whether Sir James, who was garden seeds, had promised what he could perform, she doubted, but so long as Henry mistook them for the county families when they did call, she was content. Charles and Albert Fussell now crossed the lawn. They were going for a morning dip, and a servant followed them with their bathing dresses. She had meant to take a stroll herself before breakfast, but saw that the day was still sacred to men, and amused herself by watching their contretemps. In the first place the key of the bathing-shed could not be found. Charles stood by the riverside with folded hands, tragical, while the servant shouted, and was misunderstood by another servant in the garden. Then came a difficulty about a springboard, and soon three people were running backwards and forwards over the meadow, with orders and counter-orders and recriminations and apologies. If Margaret wanted to jump from a motor-car, she jumped. If Tibby thought paddling would benefit his ankles, he paddled. If a clerk desired adventure, he took a walk in the dark. But these athletes seemed paralyzed. They could not bathe without their appliances, though the morning sun was calling and the last mists were rising from the dimpling stream. Had they found the life of the body, after all? Could not the men whom they despised as milksops beat them, even on their own ground? She thought of the bathing arrangements as they should be in her day, no worrying of servants, no appliances, beyond good sense. Her reflections were disturbed by the quiet child, who had come out to speak to the cat, but was now watching her watch the men. She called, "'Good morning, dear,' a little sharply. Her voice spread consternation. Charles looked round, and though completely attired in indigo blue, vanished into the shed and was seen no more. "'Miss Wilcox is up.' the child whispered, and then became unintelligible. "'What's that?' It sounded like, "'Cut yoke, sack back.' "'I can't hear.' "'On the bed, tissue paper.' Gathering that the wedding dress was on view, and that a visit would be seemly, she went to Evie's room. All was hilarity here. Evie, in a petticoat, was dancing with one of the Anglo-Indian ladies, while the other was adoring yards of white satin. They screamed, they laughed, they sang, and the dog barked. Margaret screamed a little, too, but without conviction. She could not feel that a wedding was so funny. Perhaps something was missing in her equipment. Evie gasped, "'Dolly is a rotter not to be here! Oh, we would rag just then!' Then Margaret went down to breakfast. Henry was already installed. He ate slowly and spoke little— and was, in Margaret's eyes, the only member of their party who dodged emotion successfully. She could not suppose him indifferent either to the loss of his daughter or to the presence of his future wife. Yet he dwelt intact, only issuing orders occasionally, orders that promoted the comfort of his guests. He inquired after her hand. He set her to pour out the coffee, and Mrs. Warrington to pour out the tea. When Evie came down there was a moment's awkwardness, and both ladies rose to vacate their places. Burton! called Henry. Serve tea and coffee from the sideboard. It wasn't genuine tact, but it was tact of a sort, the sort that is as useful as the genuine, and saves even more situations at board meetings. Henry treated a marriage like a funeral, 
item by item, never raising his eyes to the whole, and, Death, where is thy sting? Love, where is thy victory? one would exclaim at the close. After breakfast she claimed a few words with him. It was always best to approach him formally. She asked for the interview, because he was going on to shoot grouse to-morrow, and she was returning to Helen in town. "'Certainly, dear,' said he. "'Of course I have the time. What do you want?' "'Nothing. I was afraid something had gone wrong.' "'No, I have nothing to say. But you may talk.' Glancing at his watch, he talked of the nasty curve at the lich-gate. She heard him with interest. Her surface could always respond to his without contempt, though all her deeper being might be yearning to help him. She had abandoned any plan of action. Love is the best, and the more she let herself love him, the more chance was there that he would set his soul in order. Such a moment as this, when they sat under fair weather by the walks of their future home, was so sweet to her— that its sweetness would surely pierce to him. Each lift of his eyes, each parting of the thatched lip from the clean-shaven, must prelude the tenderness that kills the monk and the beast at a single blow. Disappointed a hundred times, she still hoped. She loved him with too clear a vision to fear his cloudiness. Whether he droned trivialities, as to-day, or sprang kisses on her in the twilight, she could pardon him, she could respond. "'If there is this nasty curve,' she suggested, "'couldn't we walk to the church? "'Not, of course, you and Evie, "'but the rest of us might very well go on first, "'and that would mean fewer carriages.' "'One can't have ladies walking through the market square. "'The Fussels wouldn't like it. "'They were awfully particular at Charles's wedding. "'My—she—one uh, of our party was anxious to walk, "'and certainly the church was just round the corner, "'and I shouldn't have minded, "'but the Colonel made a great point of it.' "'You men shouldn't be so chivalrous,' said Margaret thoughtfully. "'Why not?' She knew why not, but said that she did not know. He then announced that unless she had anything special to say, he must visit the wine-cellar, and they went off together in search of Burton. Though clumsy and a little inconvenient, Oniton was a genuine country house. They clattered down flagged passages, looked into room after room, and scaring unknown maids from the performance of obscure duties— the wedding breakfast must be in readiness when they came back from church, and tea would be served in the garden. The sight of so many agitated and serious people made Margaret smile, but she reflected that they were paid to be serious and enjoyed being agitated. Here were the lower wheels of the machine that was tossing Evie up into nuptial glory. A little boy blocked their way with pigtails. His mind could not grasp their greatness, and he said, "'Boy, you leave. Let me pass, please.' Henry asked him where Burton was, but the servants were so new that they did not know one another's names. In the still-room sat the band, who had stipulated for champagne as part of their fee, and who were already drinking beer. Scents of Araby came from the kitchen, mingled with cries. Margaret knew what had happened there, for it happened at Wickham Place. One of the wedding dishes had boiled over, and the cook was throwing cedar shavings to hide the smell. At last they came upon the butler. Henry gave him the keys— and handed Margaret down the cellar stairs. Two doors were unlocked. She, who kept all her wine at the bottom of the linen cupboard, was astonished at the sight. "'We shall never get through it!' she cried, and the two men were suddenly drawn into brotherhood and exchanged smiles. She felt as if she had again jumped out of the car while it was moving. Certainly Oniton would take some digesting. It would be no small business to remain herself, and yet to assimilate such an establishment— she must remain herself, for his sake as well as her own, since a shadowy wife degrades the husband whom she accompanies, and she must assimilate for reasons of common honesty, since she had no right to marry a man and make him uncomfortable. Her only ally was the power of home. The loss of Wickham Place had taught her more than its possession. Howard's End had repeated the lesson. She was determined to create new sanctities among these hills. After visiting the wine-cellar, she dressed— and then came the wedding, which seemed a small affair when compared with the preparations for it. Everything went like one o'clock. Mr. Cahill materialized out of space, and was waiting for his bride at the church door. No one dropped the ring or mispronounced the responses, or trod on Evie's train, or cried. In a few minutes the clergymen performed their duty, the register was signed, and they were back in their carriages, negotiating the dangerous curve by the lich-gate. Margaret was convinced that they had not been married at all, and that the Norman church had been intent all the time on other business. 
there were more documents to sign at the house, and the breakfast to eat, and then a few more people dropped in for the garden party. There had been a great many refusals, and after all it was not a very big affair, not as big as Margaret's would be. She noted the dishes and the strips of red carpet, that outwardly she might give Henry what was proper. But inwardly she hoped for something better than this blend of Sunday church and fox-hunting. If only someone had been upset! But this wedding had gone off so particularly well. Quite like a derbar, in the opinion of Lady Edser, and she thoroughly agreed with her. So the wasted day lumbered forward. The bride and bridegroom drove off, yelling with laughter, and for the second time the sun retreated towards the hills of Wales. Henry, who was more tired than he owned, came up to her in the castle meadow, and in tones of unusual softness said that he was pleased. Everything had gone off so well. She felt that he was praising her, too, and blushed. Certainly she had done all she could with his intractable friends, and had made a special point of kowtowing to the men. They were breaking camp this evening. Only the Warringtons and quiet child would stay the night, and the others were already moving towards the house to finish their packing. "'I think it did go off well,' she agreed. "'Since I had to jump out of the motor, I'm thankful I lighted on my left hand. I am so very glad about it, Henry, dear. I only hope that the guests at ours may be half as comfortable. You must all remember that we have no practical person among us, except my aunt, and she is not used to entertainments on a large scale.' "'I know,' he said gravely. "'Under the circumstances, it would be better to put everything into the hands of Harrods or Whiteleys, or even go to some hotel.' "'You desire a hotel?' "'Yes, because—well, I mustn't interfere with you. No doubt you want to be married from your old home.' "'My old home's falling into pieces, Henry. I only want my new. Isn't it a perfect evening?' "'The Alexandrina isn't bad.' The Alexandrina, she echoed, more occupied with the threads of smoke that were issuing from their chimneys, and ruling the sunlit slopes with parallels of grey. It's off Curzon Street. Is it? Let's be married from off Curzon Street. Then she turned westward to gaze at the swirling gold. Just where the river rounded the hill, the sun caught it. Fairyland must lie above the bend, and its precious liquid was pouring towards them past Charles's bathing shed. She gazed so long that her eyes were dazzled, and when they moved back to the house, she could not recognize the faces of people who were coming out of it. A parlor-maid was preceding them. "'Who are those people?' she asked. "'They're callers,' exclaimed Henry. "'It's too late for callers.' "'Perhaps they're town people who want to see the wedding presents.' "'I'm not at home yet to townies.' "'Well, hide among the ruins, and if I can stop them, I will.' He thanked her. Margaret went forward, smiling socially. She supposed that these were unpunctual guests, who would have to be content with vicarious civility, since Evie and Charles were gone, Henry tired, and the others in their rooms. She assumed the airs of a hostess. Not for long. For one of the group was Helen. Helen in her oldest clothes, and dominated by that tense, wounding excitement that had made her a terror in their nursery days. "'What is it?' she called. "'Oh, what's wrong?' "'Is Tibby ill?' Helen spoke to her two companions, who fell back. Then she bore forward furiously. "'They're starving!' she shouted. "'I found them starving!' "'Who? Why have you come?' "'The Basts!' "'Oh, Helen!' moaned Margaret. "'Whatever have you done now?' "'He has lost his place. He has been turned out of his bank.' "'Yes, he's done for. We upper classes have ruined him, and I suppose you'll tell me it's the battle of life. "'Starving! His wife is ill! Starving! She fainted in the train!' "'Helen, are you mad?' "'Perhaps.' "'Yes, if you like, I'm mad. But I've brought them. I'll stand in justice no longer. I'll show up the wretchedness that lies under this luxury, this talk of impersonal forces, this cant about God doing what we're too slack to do ourselves.' "'Have you actually brought two starving people from London to Shropshire, Helen?' Helen was checked. She had not thought of this, and her hysteria abated. "'There was a restaurant car on the train,' she said. "'Don't be absurd. They aren't starving, and you know it. Now begin from the beginning. I won't have such theatrical nonsense. How dare you! Yes, how dare you!' she repeated as anger filled her. "'Bursting into Evie's wedding in this heartless way!' "'My goodness, but you've a perverted notion of philanthropy. "'Look,' 
she indicated the house. Servants, people out of the windows. They think it's some vulgar scandal, and I must explain. Oh, no, it's only my sister screaming, and only two hangers on of ours, whom she has brought here for no conceivable reason. Kindly take back that word, hangers on, said Helen, ominously calm. Very well, conceded Margaret, who for all her wrath was determined to avoid a real quarrel. I, too, am sorry about them, but it beats me why you've brought them here, or why you're here yourself. It's our last chance of seeing Mr. Wilcox. Margaret moved towards the house at this. She was determined not to worry Henry. He's going to Scotland. I know he is. I insist on seeing him. Yes, tomorrow. I knew it was our last chance. How do you do, Mr. Bast? said Margaret, trying to control her voice. This is an odd business. What view do you take of it? There is Mrs. Bast, too, prompted Helen. Jackie also shook hands. She, like her husband, was shy, and furthermore ill, and furthermore so bestially stupid that she could not grasp what was happening. She only knew that the lady had swept down like a whirlwind last night, had paid the rent, redeemed the furniture, provided them with a dinner and breakfast, and ordered them to meet her at Paddington next morning. Leonard had feebly protested, and when the morning came had suggested that they shouldn't go. But she, half mesmerized, had obeyed. The lady had told them to, and they must, and their bed-sitting room had accordingly changed into Paddington, and Paddington into a railway carriage that shook and grew hot and grew cold, and vanished entirely, and reappeared amid torrents of expensive scent. "'You have fainted,' said the lady in an awestruck voice. "'Perhaps the air would do you good.' And perhaps it had, for here she was, feeling rather better among a lot of flowers. "'I am sure I don't want to intrude.' began Leonard, in answer to Margaret's question. "'But you have been so kind to me in the past, in warning me about the Porphyrian, that I wondered—why, I wondered whether—' "'Whether we could get him back into the Porphyrian again,' supplied Helen. "'Meg, this has been a cheerful business. A bright evening's work that was on Chelsea Embankment.' Margaret shook her head and returned to Mr. Bast. "'I don't understand. You left the Porphyrian because we suggested it was a bad concern, didn't you?' "'That's right.' "'And went into a bank instead.' "'I told you all that,' said Helen. "'And they reduced their staff after he had been in a month, "'and now he's penniless, "'and I consider that we and our informant are directly to blame.' "'I hate all this,' Leonard muttered. "'I hope you do, Mr. Burst. "'But it's no good mincing matters. "'You have done yourself no good by coming here. "'If you intend to confront Mr. Wilcox, "'and to call him to account for a chance remark, "'you will make a very great mistake.' "'I brought them. I did it all!' cried Helen. "'I can only advise you to go at once. My sister has put you in a false position, and it is kindest to tell you so. It's too late to get to town, but you'll find a comfortable hotel in Oniton, where Mrs. Bast can rest, and I hope you'll be my guests there.' "'That isn't what I want, Miss Schlegel,' said Leonard. "'You're very kind, and no doubt it's a false position, but you make me miserable. I seem no good at all.' "'It's work he wants,' interpreted Helen. "'Can't you see?' Then he said, "'Jackie, let's go. We're more bother than we're worth. We're costing these ladies pounds and pounds already to get work for us, and they never will. There's nothing we're good enough to do.' "'We would like to find you work,' said Margaret, rather conventionally. "'We want to. I, like my sister, you're only down in your luck. Go to the hotel.' "'Have a good night's rest, and some day you shall pay me back the bill, if you prefer it.' But Leonard was near the abyss, and at such moments men see clearly. "'You don't know what you're talking about,' he said. "'I shall never get work now. "'If rich people fail at one profession, they can try another. "'Not I. "'I had my groove, and I've got out of it. "'I could do one particular branch of insurance in one particular office well enough to command a salary, but that's all. "'Poetry's nothing, Miss Schlegel.' One's thoughts about this and that are nothing. Your money, too, is nothing, if you'll understand me. I mean, if a man over twenty once loses his own particular job, it's all over with him. I have seen it happen to others. The friends gave them money for a little, but in the end they fall over the edge. It's no good. It's a whole world pulling. There will always be rich and poor. He ceased. "'Won't you have something to eat?' said Margaret. I don't know what to do. 
It isn't my house, and though Mr. Wilcox would have been glad to see you at any other time. As I say, I don't know what to do, but I undertake to do what I can for you. Helen, offer them something. Do try a sandwich, Mrs. Bast. They moved to a long table behind which a servant was still standing. Iced cakes, sandwiches, innumerable. Coffee, claret cup, champagne remained almost intact. Their overfed guests could do no more. Leonard refused. Jackie thought she could manage a little. Margaret left them whispering together and had a few more words with Helen. She said, "'Helen, I like Mr. Bast. I agree that he's worth helping. I agree that we are directly responsible.' "'No, indirectly, via Mr. Wilcox. Let me tell you once for all that if you take up that attitude, I'll do nothing. No doubt you're right, logically, and are entitled to say a great many scathing things about Henry. Only I won't have it, so choose.' Helen looked at the sunset. "'If you promise to take them quietly to the George, I will speak to Henry about them, in my own way, mind. There is to be none of this absurd screaming about justice. I have no use for justice. If it was only a question of money, we could do it ourselves. But he wants work, and that we can't give him. But possibly Henry can.' "'It's his duty to,' grumbled Helen. "'Nor am I concerned with duty.' I am concerned with the characters of various people whom we know, and how, things being as they are, things may be made a little better. Mr. Wilcox hates being asked favours. All businessmen do. But I am going to ask him, at the risk of a rebuff, because I want to make things a little better. Very well. I promise. You take it very calmly. Take them off to the George, then, and I'll try. Poor creatures! But they look tired. As they parted, she added, "'I haven't nearly done with you, though, Helen. You have been most self-indulgent. I can't get over it. You have less restraint rather than more as you grow older. Think it over, and alter yourself, or we shan't have happy lives.' She rejoined Henry. Fortunately, he had been sitting down. These physical matters were important. "'Was it Townies?' he asked, greeting her with a pleasant smile. "'You'll never believe me.' said Margaret, sitting down beside him. It's all right now, but it was my sister. Helen here, he cried, preparing to rise. But she refused the invitation. I thought she despised weddings. Don't get up. She has not come to the wedding. I've bundled her off to the George. Inherently hospitable, he protested. No, she has two of her protégés with her, and must keep with them. Let them all come. My dear Henry, did you see them? I did catch sight of a brown bunch of a woman, certainly. <laughs> the brown bunch was Helen. But did you catch sight of a sea-green and salmon bunch? What? Are they out bean-feasting? No, business. They wanted to see me, and later on I want to talk to you about them. She was ashamed of her own diplomacy. In dealing with the Wilcox, how tempting it was to lapse from comradeship, and to give him the kind of woman that he desired. Henry took the hint at once, and said— why later on? Tell me now. No time like the present. Shall I? If it isn't a long story. Oh, not five minutes. But there's a sting at the end of it, for I want you to find the man some work in your office. What are his qualifications? I don't know. He's a clerk. How old? Twenty-five, perhaps. What's his name? Bast said Margaret, and was about to remind him that they had met at Wickham Place, but stopped herself. It had not been a successful meeting. "'Where was he before?' "'Dempster's Bank.' "'Why did he leave?' he asked, still remembering nothing. "'They reduced their staff. "'All right, I'll see him.' It was the reward of her tact and devotion through the day. Now she understood why some women prefer influence to rights. Mrs. Plinlimmon, when condemning suffragettes, had said— the woman who can't influence her husband to vote the way she wants ought to be ashamed of herself. Margaret had winced, but she was influencing Henry now, and though pleased at her little victory, she knew that she had won it by the methods of the harem. "'I should be glad if you took him,' she said, "'but I don't know whether he's qualified. "'I'll do what I can. "'But, Margaret, this mustn't be taken as a precedent.' "'No, of course, of course. "'I can't fit in your protégé every day.' business would suffer. I can promise you he's the last. He... he's rather a special case. Protégés always are. 
she let it stand at that. He rose with a little extra touch of complacency, and held out his hand to help her up. How wide the gulf between Henry as he was, and Henry as Helen thought he ought to be! And she herself, hovering as usual between the two, now accepting men as they are, now yearning with her sister for truth. Love and truth, their warfare seems eternal. Perhaps the whole visible world rests on it, and if they were one, life itself, like the spirits when Prospero was reconciled to his brother, might vanish into air, into thin air. "'Your protégé has made us late,' said he. "'The fussels will just be starting.' On the whole she sided with men as they are. Henry would save the basts as he had saved Howard's end, while Helen and her friends were discussing the ethics of salvation. His was a slapdash method, but the world has been built slapdash, and the beauty of mountain and river and sunset may be but the varnish with which the unskilled artificer hides his joins. Oniton, like herself, was imperfect. Its apple trees were stunted, its castle ruinous. It, too, had suffered in the border warfare between the Anglo-Saxon and the Celt, between things as they are and as they ought to be. Once more the West was retreating. Once again the orderly stars were dotting the eastern sky. There is certainly no rest for us on the earth. But there is happiness, and as Margaret descended the mound on her lover's arm, she felt that she was having her share. To her annoyance, Mrs. Bast was still in the garden. The husband and Helen had left her there to finish her meal while they went to engage rooms. Margaret found this woman repellent. She had felt, when shaking her hand, an overpowering shame. She remembered the motive of her call at Wickham Place, and smelt again odours from the abyss, odours the more disturbing because they were involuntary. For there was no malice in Jackie. There she sat, a piece of cake in one hand, an empty champagne glass in the other, doing no harm to anybody. "'She's overtired,' Margaret whispered. "'She's something else,' said Henry. "'This won't do. I can't have her in my garden in the state.' "'Is she—' Margaret hesitated to add, drunk. Now that she was going to marry him, he had grown particular. He discountenanced risque conversations now. Henry went up to the woman. She raised her face, which gleamed in the twilight like a puffball. "'Madam, you will be more comfortable in the hotel,' he said sharply. Jackie replied, "'If it isn't Hen!' "'Ne crois pas que le mari lui ressemble,' apologized Margaret. "'Il est tout à fait différent.' "'Henry!' she repeated, quite distinctly. Mr. Wilcox was much annoyed. "'I can't congratulate you on your protégés.' he remarked. "'Anne, don't go. You do love me, dear, don't you?' "'Bless us, what a person!' sighed Margaret, gathering up her skirts. Jackie pointed with her cake. "'You're a nice boy, you are,' she yawned. "'There, now, I love you.' "'Henry, I am awfully sorry.' "'And pray why?' he asked, and looked at her so sternly that she feared he was ill. He seemed more scandalised than the facts demanded. "'To have brought this down on you?' "'Pray don't apologize. The voice continued. "'Why does she call you Hen?' said Margaret innocently. "'Has she ever seen you before?' "'Seen Anne before?' said Jackie. "'Who hasn't seen Anne? "'E servin' you like me, my dear. "'These boys. "'You wait. "'Still we love em. "'Are you now satisfied?' Henry asked. Margaret began to grow frightened. "'I don't know what it is all about,' she said. "'Let's come in.' But he thought she was acting. He thought he was trapped. He saw his whole life crumbling. "'Don't you indeed?' he said bitingly. "'I do. Allow me to congratulate you on the success of your plan.' "'This is Helen's plan, not mine. I now understand your interest in the Basts. Very well thought out. I am amused at your caution, Margaret. You are quite right. It was necessary.' I am a man, and have lived a man's past. I have the honour to release you from your engagement. Still, she could not understand. She knew of life's seamy side as a theory. She could not grasp it as a fact. More words from Jackie were necessary, words unequivocal, undenied. "'So that!' burst from her, and she went indoors. She stopped herself from saying more. "'So what?' asked Colonel Fessel, who was getting ready to start in the hall. We were saying, Henry and I were just having the fiercest argument, my point being. Seizing his fur coat from a footman, she offered to help him on. 
He protested, and there was a playful little scene. "'No, let me do that,' said Henry, following. "'Thanks so much. You see, he has forgiven me.' The colonel said gallantly, "'I don't expect there's much to forgive.' He got into the car. The ladies followed him after an interval. Maids, courier, and heavier luggage had been sent on earlier by the branch line. Still chattering, still thanking their host and patronizing their future hostess, the guests were home away. Then Margaret continued, "'So that woman has been your mistress?' "'You put it with your usual delicacy,' he replied. "'When, please?' "'Why? When, please?' Ten years ago.' She left him without a word. For it was not her tragedy— it was Mrs. Wilcox's. End of chapter 26